Appropriate just released their new 5.2 update, and there are a ton of amazing new features, including 3D painting and a bunch of awesome accessibility features. But as a surface designer, how can you use the 3D features to create cool mock-ups from your art? And where are all of those accessibility features? What are all of those features? Well, we're gonna go over all of that in this video. Hi, by the way, my name is Brooke Glazer. I'm a professional illustrator and a top teacher on Skillshare. My work can be found in places like Target and used in products like kids apparel, greeting cards, gift wrap, and more. Now, if you're not interested in the 3D stuff, you can skip ahead using the timestamps in the description of this video. If you're new to Procreate, I'd recommend checking out my Intro to Procreate class. We're not gonna go over the basics here. We're gonna cut straight to the chase. What are the new features? Where can you find them? And tips and tricks for taking advantage of them. So let's get started. The biggest update in Procreate 5.2 is the ability to paint on 3D models, which is nuts. Procreate has provided a handful of 3D models for you to use. To download them, open any canvas, go to the wrench icon, the help tab, and tap what's new. And there's a button right here in this first slide to download the model pack. Here's a model that I've already painted on. So let's go over how to move in a 3D canvas because it's a little bit different than moving in a 2D one. So you use one finger to move around your model and to rotate it. And you use two fingers to zoom in or zoom out. You can also use two fingers to just slide your model across the screen. And what's really fun is if you swipe across the screen, it'll actually spin your model. And if you swipe really fast, wee! Let's go over how you can paint on a 3D model. And I've opened up a fresh canvas here that I haven't already painted on, so it's easier to see what's going on. If you tap on part of the model, it'll flash blue, and then you can start painting on that part. Now it'll only paint on the area that's visible from the camera angle, so if I rotate this, you'll see it's only painted where I actually could see the canvas. So if I go like that, Boom, just, just painting on that area. Now let's check out the lid here. If I tap on the tab here, it's only letting me paint on the tab and not on the lid, which is very useful. Let's switch colors and I'll tap on the lid and now I'm only painting on that lid. But what if I wanna paint the tab and the lid at the same time? If I hold this modify button, which is the button between the two sliders here and then tap, it's going to select both of those. And now I can paint over both of them all at the same time. But you might have noticed this only painted on the lid and not on the can itself. So what's going on here? Why is that? Well, to understand that, we're gonna to wanna to go into the layers. In the layers, there are two main groups here. There is the lid and the can sections. These are called texture sets. The can and the lid do not share textures. They don't share painting. So I cannot paint on the can and get into that lid area. But you also probably noticed that I was able to paint separately on the tab and the lid. So within this texture set, the shape of the tab and the shape of the lid are separate meshes. And the mesh is the shape of that part of the model. So if I turn the visibility of the layer off, the lid is gone and now I can look deep into the can. And if I turn the tab off, the tab shape disappears. So those are separate shapes. Now I'm gonna tap on the tab layer here. This layer right here, this is just the shape of that tab. It's the layers underneath, which are the painting layers. So this is the layer that I painted on and this is the base layer, which Procreate provides. So this is the layer I paint on this is just the shape layer. So essentially this is acting like a clipping mask. When I am in the tab section, it only lets me paint in the shape of the tab. And if I'm in the lid section, it only lets me paint in the shape of the lid. But as you notice, when I tap between these two shapes, these layers are the same. So this, this painting layer, that is the painting on my tab and on my lid. And this is just moving between those two clipping masks, essentially. So the lid and the tab share painting layers or base layers. And by the way, this base layer is the one that Procreate created. It's got this beautiful, shiny metallic texture on here. And so I created my own new layer by tapping on the plus icon here so that I didn't paint over the beautiful layer that Procreate provided. Like I mentioned before, when you're drawing in 3D space, it's only drawing where the camera is visible. So if I try and draw a circle right here, 
I have only drawn a half circle at the edge. It's, it's not drawing on both sides of the can. But the good news is you can also actually do this by drawing in 2D. So if you tap the wrench icon and go to the 3D tab here, you can swap to the 2D textures. And this is going to flatten out that 3D image. And so I can come in here and I can actually draw a full circle. Now, in order to see that, I have to come back and turn 3D on and, oh, cool, there's the circle. But swapping between 2D and 3D view is kind of a pain. So here's a cool trick. If you go to the Canvas tab and you tap this reference image on, now you, have, you can choose between referencing your 2D texture or your 3D image. And you can watch, you can draw in real time. So I can come in here and I can draw little circles and watch them appear on my can in real time. Now, this flattened out 2D feature is really great, but occasionally it may not work exactly like you expect. If you've ever unfolded a cardboard box, you can imagine how this painting gets wrapped around a model. When you pull apart a cardboard box where it gets glued together, it doesn't form a box, it forms a long rectangle with the flaps on either side. The more complex our 3D models are, the more bizarre that flattened version can be. To better understand that concept, let's look at a more complicated model like our roller skate here. Let's say that I just wanna paint the wheels. So I'm gonna turn on the 2D texture here and I'll turn on my reference over to the side. So this flat layer is the drawing of the wheels that Procreate has already provided. And let's say I want to draw the wheel a blue color. Cool, so I draw right there and, and that, that's that side of the wheel. But what happens when I draw on this part of the wheel? Well, that's actually covering this backside of that wheel there. And these strips right here, that's actually this side of the wheel. So as you can see, the artist who created this model and painted the beautiful base layers for it had to find different sections on this flattened area where they could place each of these textures and they're not necessarily in a place that you would expect them to be. So drawing in 2D is great, but sometimes when you paint on these flattened versions, it doesn't show up in the 3D model exactly where you would expect it to. It may take a little bit of experimentation to find out where the edges of your model actually are. As a surface designer, 3D models can be a really cool way to mop up your existing designs by bringing in art that you've already made. So let's try this out with the surfboard. I'm gonna to go to the wrench icon and I'm gonna tap on the add tab, insert a photo and I'm gonna choose this piece right here. You'll notice when this got inserted, it got put in there with kind of like a white circle around the art. And if I use two fingers, I can pinch and zoom and rotate and make my art bigger and different sizes. Now there's this option called projection right here, which is a little bit different than something that you would see in a 2D canvas. So if I move my surfboard so that I can kind of see both sides of it, and I'm gonna tap projection, turn on bi-directional, and I'm gonna use this scan right here. So essentially what's happening is projection depth is saying, how deep does this illustration go? So you can see this is actually showing up on both sides of the surfboard now, kind of as though the printing went all the way through the surfboard, as if the ink soaked all the way down through. And you can see like it's, it's rotating around, so it's showing as if this was printed in a bi bi-directionally all the way through. Now, as I adjust this projection depth, as it gets more narrow, it doesn't go all the way through. So this projection depth can really impact how deeply your art shows through. And if I turn off bi-directional, it's only gonna show on one side of the surface. There's also this advanced tab right here, and this is gonna give you much more fine control over the objects that you put in here. So you'll see that there is this full circle right here, and if I grab that circle and I pull on it, it's going to adjust the size, it's gonna scale it, and if I grab it and turn, it's going to rotate. Now if I kind of come to the side here, there is a circle inside of that circle, and if I drag that, that will allow me to move my art around. And if I tap on it, it's gonna have this option that says detach. It's gonna move this circle out. So now I can have a little bit more of an easy time moving my art with that circle so I can see what I'm doing and I can grab my controls a little bit better. And if I tap attach, it's gonna snap it right back to the art again. So these blue cubes 
will allow me to squash and stretch my art. And this blue circle right here, this is actually going to tilt my art. It's going to rotate it at an angle. Let's come back to our can example. And if I tap on the wrench icon and I try and insert a photo, and I want to expand this out, remember how I mentioned that you can only paint as far as the canvas can see? Well, because I'm doing this in 3D mode, if I want to zoom this art bigger, it's going to end up cropping it. Sometimes it's easier to insert an image using the 2D version. So let's do that now. Okay, now I've got my reference image over here and my 2D textures over here. I'm going to go to the wrench icon. I'm going to insert that photo again. And boom, whoa, that took up a ton of space on the can. So I actually want to make this smaller. And now that is taking up a much more reasonable space on the can. And I want the can to be the same color all the way around. So I'm going to add a new layer, put it beneath the my snake and color drop so that it's all black. Pretty neat, huh? Now this is cool and I love putting just like a, a placement illustration in here, but I can also insert a repeating pattern. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to insert this illustration right here. And this illustration happens to be a repeating tile. So if I drag this down here and then I duplicate that image, I can drag this over and line it up. So that it is actually repeating right there. So cool. I've, I've started to get a repeating pattern here, but it doesn't wrap all the way around the can. So I'm going to select both of these images and I am going to stretch this out and I'm getting closer. This is almost all the way wrapped around now. Let's try dragging this a little bit further and boom. I've now it's wrapping all the way around the can. If I want, I can even kind of squash this upwards and downwards so that it fills the whole can. And now I've used a repeating image to go all the way around my can. With the world of 3D comes some fun new textures that you can add to your 3D objects. So here I've added some really fun, shiny, glossy details. So in the, you can see some really shiny accents in the rows and on the snake's body, even the eyes are glittering. I made this, these stars kind of like they've got gold foil on them. All right. So how can you do that? Well, there are two ways and I'm going to show you both. So I'll go over to this side of the can because I've not added any shiny details to this side. I'm going to add a new layer. And the first way that we're going to add these accents is with a brush. So I'm going to choose the brush that I want to draw with here. And there's a new section called materials. And in these materials, you have two new settings, metallic and roughness. Now metallic, when you use this slider, you're either going to have a more metallic effect or it's going to be a non metallic effect. Pretty self explanatory, but roughness is a little less self explanatory. So when you pull the slider all the way up, the effect that your brush is going to have is going to be very matte. And if you pull it all the way down, it's going to be very glossy. So for our purposes, I want to create a very metallic, glossy brush. And then I'm going to zoom into the flower right here and I'm going to choose a gold color. And as I draw, you'll see it's creating a very glossy effect. Now you can choose different colors. You can choose a light purple, you could choose a pink and they all have slightly different colors associated with them. Now, unfortunately, these effects do not work in 2D canvases because the effect relies on movement and lights, which you don't have in a 2D canvas. So these materials really only show up on your 3D canvases. Okay. How about that second way for that second way? Let's make this star up here. Let's make it shiny. The second method doesn't rely on using the brush. It's another option in your layers panel. So let's open the layers. This layer right here is my art and there is a little cube right here. And if I tap on it, it's going to open up a color tab, a roughness and a metallic tab. Whatever you draw when metallic is selected will affect 
what parts of the canvas show metallic. And the same with the roughness. Whatever you draw in the roughness will either show as glossy or matte. And whatever you draw in the color is just going to decide what color that base layer is. So let's try it out here. If I am in the metallic, this is kind of like masks. If I draw with white, if I draw with white, it's going to reveal a metallic surface. And if I draw with black, it's going to hide that metallic surface. So it's kind of like curtains. White sheer curtains will reveal and black curtains will conceal. So white to show the metallic effects and black to hide them. And now I'm going to go to the roughness. With roughness, white will make the art look matte and black will make it look glossy. So black hides that matte effect. And now I've got a shiny star. Now, if I wanted to have a slightly less shiny effect, I could try using a gray color. And that's going to reduce the amount of shine on there. Let's check out the sunglass model. And if I zoom in here, I can see that actually something is being reflected in these sunglasses. And we can actually choose what that is. If you tap on the wrench icon and you go to 3D, and tap edit lighting and environment, there is this option called environment. And I'm gonna zoom in to these glasses. And when I swap between these, it's gonna change what you're seeing. And there's one that's called Savage. I think this is so fun. This is actually the Savage office. And Savage is the company that makes Procreate. So that is super fun that they included that. Now, you might notice that the lights are actually changing as I choose a different environment. And the lights are actually these boxes right here. As I switch it, they're really changing colors. But you can actually control the lighting yourself. So if you tap on one of these lights, you can decide what the hue and saturation of that light is gonna be and the intensity, how bright that light is. And you can see it's actually having an effect on the sunglasses. Because this light is green and the sunglasses are white, it's making the sunglasses look green. You can also move these lights. So if you tap and drag on them, it's gonna change where your light is positioned. So I could make something really spooky. So like if you were like, put this underneath of the sunglasses and it's kind of like putting a flashlight under your face. You can have all kinds of fun and create all kinds of different moods by playing with the lights in your scene. If you wanna add another light, you can add up to four lights by tapping on the add light button there. Now that you've created this beautiful 3D model, you might wanna share it with the world. So if we go to the wrench icon and the share tab, there's lots of ways that you can do this. So you can share this model itself. So you can share that Procreate file. You could also save it as a USDZ or an OBJ. And those are files that you can use in other 3D applications. You can also share an image. So if you wanna share a JPEG, the image of your JPEG is going to be the size that you've got it in this canvas and the rotation. So if you wanna get it at this angle, you gotta move your model onto the screen to the angle that you want it at, and then you can tap JPEG. So if you want it super zoomed in, you can grab a JPEG like that. And if you want it fully on screen, just move it fully on screen. Another exciting way to share your model is this PNG. So PNGs allow for transparent backgrounds. And if we go into that 3D model and edit lighting and environment again, you can actually turn off the environment. And now when you go to share your PNG, the background is going to be transparent. I'll just undo that and turn the background back on. There are also video files that you can share your beautiful model in. So if you tap GIF, you can see what's going on right here. You can actually uh, turn off the environment and make the background transparent in an animated GIF as well. And you can also control these settings to change the animation. So you can say, you know what, I don't want this to zoom that much. I just want it to spin right there. And if you affect the ease, the ease kind of like eases the animation in and out. You can also extend the animation duration so it kind of rotates slower. There's also an animated PNG and an animated MP4. Now the difference with an MP4 is that you can actually choose to 
create a square animation. This is great if you want to share a square image on Instagram. You can also switch the type of animation that you're getting here. So you can have an animated swing and you can mess with the settings here as well. But unlike a GIF or a PNG, you cannot create a transparent background with an MP4. And finally, you can share just the textures, just the paintings that you've made in PNG files. And these can be used in other 3D softwares as well. All right, finally, there's another cool feature and that is view in AR. So if you go to the wrench icon, the 3D tab and tap view in AR, it's going to bring the model up into 3D space and it can take a second for it to generate. But once it shows up, you can use your finger to drag and drop it. And you can use two fingers to rotate it. And once it's in place, you can move your camera around to see it in real space. If you have a hard time remembering the brushes that you use, this new feature is gonna be very exciting. So at the very top of your brush library, there is a new folder called Recent, and this is going to constantly update with the last eight brushes that you used. So if I go into the painting brush and I use this Nico Rub and I draw something there, when I go to the Recent brushes, boom, Nego Rub is at the top of this folder. So like I said, there are eight brushes that are constantly rotating in here, but there's some other really cool things that you can do. So let's say you know that you use this brush. I'm not gonna attempt to say that name, but you don't remember where it was in here that you found it. So if you swipe to the right, you can tap find, and it's gonna open up that category where that brush was stored, which is super useful. You can also pin your favorite brush to the top so that you're so that it's always there even if you draw with something else so let's i'll draw with a jagged brush i'll try some charcoals i'll try another charcoal but when i come back to this recent recently used brushes the one that i pinned and it's got a little star right here is still at the top another new exciting feature is brush size and opacity memory. So if you slide these sliders, it's gonna change the size of your brush, right? But if you tap on there, there's this little plus icon and you tap on that, it's gonna create a saved memory spot. So if I tap up here, I'll save that size and I'll save a small, super small one. So you can save four sections per slider. And now when I tap, I can just tap between these sizes. So I've got a really big size, I've got a medium size, I've got a small size and I've got a really tiny size. So that is super useful for jumping back and forth between sizes. So again, you can also create those memory spots for your opacity slider. And what's really cool is that this can be custom set for both your brush and eraser. So if you like to use the same brush uh, for an eraser, you can create your own custom sizes for that eraser. So different sizes for your brush and different sizes saved for your eraser. If you are a fan of Streamline, there's several new settings for it, and they're in their own section in the Brush Studio, and they're all under stabilization now. So there are three different ways of controlling the movement in your brushes, and that's Streamline, Stabilization, and Motion Filtering. If you're already familiar with Streamline, you know that it kind of force smooths out your lines. So they kind of are forced to be nice and flowy and curvy. But there's this new setting in here called pressure. So if I draw with varying amounts of pressure in this stroke, when this pressure setting is turned all the way off, it's going to just allow me to push, allow me to use whatever amount of pressure that I want. But if I turn this up, it's going to smooth out those transitions from thick to thin. So that means it's going to transition much more smoothly between thick and thin points of pressure. So if you have trouble controlling how hard and soft you press, this is going to be great to help keep your lines a little bit more consistent. Now these stabilization and motion filtering settings are brand new, and I'm going to do my best to describe these, but it's really something that you have to feel on your own. If you have a shaky hand, stabilization and motion filtering have been created with you in mind. Stabilization feels very different to me from Streamline. And the best way I can describe it is that Streamline, it kind of feels like, like I'm trying to ice a cake. It kind of forces everything to squeeze out round. Whereas Stabilization, 
stabilization feels kind of tacky or sticky, kind of like it's like a spider web that my pen is pushing and pulling around. Stabilization feels much nicer to use when I'm trying to draw straight lines. And yes, it can help me make some really nice smooth curves, but it can also help me make really nice smooth straight lines. And in fact, that is how stabilization and motion filtering work. The faster that you draw, the straighter it's going to try and force that line. So if I draw a little bit slower, it doesn't force it to be quite as straight. And actually also, the higher you crank these settings up, the more it's gonna try and force it to be straight. So again, I'm really shaking my hand around, but it's forcing the line straight. And if I draw slower, it's still trying to make it straight. But again, the lower that I pull this, the more it's gonna let you have that wobble in your hand. So what about motion filtering? Motion filtering is designed to eliminate unwanted motion in your hands. So as I understand it, with stabilization, Procreate is trying to stabilize your lines. But hey, if you wanna make sharp angles or curves, depending on how fast or slow you move, you'll still be able to make those wobbly lines. But motion filtering is gonna work even harder to eliminate those wobbles. It's meant to help with tremors in your hand, which is great news for artists with Parkinson's. Let's try drawing a spiral line to kind of demonstrate this. So if I've got it set at like a medium setting, I can create a nice spiral line. Now, the faster I try and draw that, the more it's gonna kind of straighten that out. And as I turn this setting up, you'll really notice it trying to force you to a straighter line. Let's try drawing it at say it's something like 80%. So again, if I try and really fast do a spiral line, it's really forcing me to a straight line. But if I draw slowly, it's letting me do a spiral line. But the faster I draw, the more it's, it's limiting the movement in my hand. Now then there is this expression setting. And expression adds a little bit more of that hand-drawn feeling back into your motion filtering. So let's try at like 50-50 for both of them. Watch what happens here. See how it kind of adds like a little bit of a wiggle? It's really fun to watch. So basically, if you do have a serious shake in your hands, you can crank up that motion filtering, but still retain some of that hand-drawn feeling with the expression setting. What's really exciting about these new features is that they don't have to be set on a per brush basis. You can actually set them globally for all of your brushes. So if you go to the wrench icon, you go to the preference tab and you tap pressure and smoothing, you can see here are both your stabilization and motion filtering settings. If you want to, you can set up stabilization for every single brush in your library using these settings right here and then turn it on and off whenever you wanna use it instead of going into each brush and changing the individual settings. Now there's one extra setting that I wanna go over and that is tip attachment. So let's try turning that on. So when tip attachment is on, it kind of glues the stroke to your brush. So every time that you're moving, the, the stroke is, is right next to the tip of your pen. And when you have it turned off, it kind of lags behind. So if you move fast, the stroke is slowly catching up to you. And I like that because for me, it makes it easier to see what motion filtering is actually doing and how it's correcting my strokes. The one thing that I really want you to pay attention with these new settings and stabilization and motion filtering is that pushing these filters all the way up is going to have extreme results. Personally, my best results come from using them at somewhere in the 30 to 50% range. This is where the effects don't force my lines, but smooth them out. The faster that you naturally draw, the lower you'll probably want these settings to be. If you tend to draw slower, you can really crank them up higher. You may also find that drawing shorter strokes will give you better results with the settings cranked up high. But everyone draws at different speeds, with different amounts of pressure, and with different amounts of shakiness. So what feels good to you with these settings is gonna be very personal. My dad is colorblind. Since he can't visually see which colors look good together, he's actually memorized his outfit so he can know, hey, this shirt and these pants, they, they match, they look good together. But that doesn't mean that he knows by going into a shop what color a shirt is. He still needs somebody to tell him. 
So if you're colorblind, I know how valuable it can be to have a color identifier. And this new update is gonna be incredibly useful for you. If you go to the wrench icon, we'll go to the help tab over here and we'll tap on advanced settings. And if you scroll down, you'll see there's a color description notifications. We'll go back to Procreate. And now, whenever I drag around down here, there is an update in this bar right here and it's telling you what color you are choosing. So I can scroll around in a circle here and it'll tell me, okay, I'm getting a dark brown, I'm getting an orange, I'm getting a lightish gray orange, or if you go around in this bar. The same with the color palette cards, they are all named uh, accurately. This is also great if you have an argument over what color is what color. So I am always arguing that this color is purple with my partner, but uh, Procreate proves me wrong. If I eye drop on that color, I can see that this is actually a blue, not a purple. But this works with the eyedropper as well. So as I go over different sections of color in this piece of art, I can check and see what color it actually is. Another exciting update for those of you who have trouble reading these teeny tiny menus, you can now make that font bigger. So if you go into your general iOS settings and you scroll to the accessibility and you tap on display and text size, there is a larger text option here. And if you turn that on, you can scroll and choose which size you'd like the text to be. So that'll change the font across the entirety of your iPad. But now with this 5.2 update, Procreate is actually going to respond to that. So now you can see we've got actually bigger text, bigger layers, everything is a little bit easier to see. Another neat feature is feedback sounds. So again, so again, you're gonna to wanna to hit the wrench icon, the help tab, and the advanced settings. And if you scroll down, you can tap feedback sounds. All right, let's go back to Procreate. Now, when I tap and add a new layer, it creates a sound. Uh, I think my favorite is the selection tool here. you've closed the selection. So it actually records a sound while you're making the selection and when you close off the selection. Pretty fun, huh? In these advanced settings, another new feature is this single touch gestures companion. So let's go back to Procreate. And this actually brings up a menu so that you can do things with one finger. So you can undo and redo with a single finger. Uh, sometimes I have trouble zooming in and out with my fingers or like, or like pinching to zoom. I mean, that was a bad example. It worked really well, but sometimes it doesn't. But with this, now I can do it with one finger. So I can zoom and rotate, I can move the canvas and I can fit the canvas to screen. You can also move this menu by grabbing that top gray bar to a different part of the canvas if you need that space open for drawing. Okay, so let's move on to PDFs. To import a PDF, you're gonna tap the import button and then you're just gonna to navigate to wherever you have downloaded your PDF. This PDF happens to be the one that is from my um, how to find your style class. And when you tap on it, it's going to open it up as a canvas. And each of these pages is going to be represented uh, by a little thumbnail down here in this toolbar at the bottom. And if I tap on them, I can move between the thumbnails or the pages. Now, Procreate has essentially taken each page of this PDF and created it on its own layer. If you tap and hold these little icons, you can actually rearrange the order of the pages, which is super handy. Let's say that you would like to write some answers in on this PDF, but you know what, maybe you're gonna change your mind and you want to erase that first answer. Uh, well, what happens is you've written that on the same page, the same layer as the PDF. So if I wanna write on this PDF with a second layer and I tap in here to create a new layer, that new layer is created a new page in this PDF and I don't want that. I want to be able to draw a new layer on this page. So what you need to do is you need to group those two layers together. And now when I draw my answer or you know my drawing or whatever in here, it's on its own layer. This multi-page PDF import and drawing tool can be really helpful for those of you who are working on storyboards or comics. Um, just having multi-pages can be super useful. So I hope that helps. You can also use Procreate to create your own PDFs. So for example, I've got a bunch of different pieces of art on different layers here in this document. And if I go to the wrench icon, canvas tab, and tap page assist, it'll put each of these art on their own page. And now I can tap through these different pages to see the different pieces of art. And I can also 
come to the Share tab and export as a PDF, and I can choose what quality of PDF I'd like to use. Adjustment layers and pencils were introduced in Procreate 5X, but they've gotten a slight refresh in 5.2. So there's a slightly new UI for it, and you can switch between using layer and pencil mode without exiting the tool. So if you're unfamiliar with the adjustment layers versus pencil, let's do a little walkthrough here. So I've got the color of this teacup on its own layer, right? I'm gonna use the hue, saturation, and brightness tool to change the color of the teacup. So in the new UI, there is a toolbar up here and a little downward arrow. And if I tap on that, this is what's gonna let me choose between using layer mode and pencil mode. If I use the layer mode, I'm gonna change the entire layer all in one move. But if I use the pencil mode, the changes that I make are only going to be affected on the area where I draw them. So I'm going to change the color of the handle here. So the biggest part of the update here is that you don't have to exit the tool to switch between these two modes. Whew, that was a lot. There are so many amazing hidden features in Procreate, and if you found this tutorial helpful, I encourage you to check out my Intro to Procreate class on Skillshare, which has over 90,000 students. I've also got classes on color theory, how to draw, how to find your style, how to make a living out as an artist, and much, much more. If you don't have a Skillshare membership, I got you. You can use the link in the